Good afternoon and welcome to this NCEO webinar on the GDPR, what does it mean for your charity? My name is Gary Shipsey. Uh, I'm going to be running the main uh, content of the session today. Later on, we'll be joined by my colleague, John Mosier, who will be involved in the question and answer session. We're going to be having 30 minutes of content from myself and then 15 minutes of questions and answers Please do submit your questions as we're going through this. We've got many people who've already submitted questions beforehand. We will try and get through as many as possible after the 30 minute presentation. Okay, without further ado, let's have a look about some of these key questions that people are asking about the GDPR. And I think there's a risk at the moment that we're kind of got to a strange place. It's as if we're a bit, uh, we're pregnant. We're waiting for this big day to arrive next year. We're waiting for the 25th of May and everyone has been focused on, on that date for so long. Any of the parents out there will think, actually, we know what really happens, that the big build-up happens, the child arrives and then we get home. And then there's this quiet period when everyone leaves and the baby is sleeping there quietly. And you think, ah, now the fun really begins. What do we do for the next 20 years, the next 30 years, as this child develops and evolves? And really that's where we are with the GDPR. This is not a Y2K situation where we hit a certain date, we realize it didn't quite explode as we thought it was going to, and then we go back to normal. This is a continuation of data protection law that's been around since 1984. It's the first major update in 20 years, that is true, but it's not about an arbitrary date next year. It's about how we're going to continue to handle and manage personal information next July, next August, 2019, 2020. So really it's about trying to prepare for that in the best way possible. And the only way to really do that is to look at where you are now. Many of the principles many of the key aspects of the future law are exactly the same as what we've got now in the current law. So for example, it is principle-based. It is not rule-based, it does not tell you literally what to do. That's the situation now, that will be the same next May. What it does mean is that you have to understand the principles and interpret them for your setting, for the level of personal data that you handle, for the sensitivity of that information, for the level of risk that your organization is or is not willing to take. Also the same is the fact that there are guiding principles and actually they are staying the same. They are already a pretty sound way of managing personal information to have appropriate security, to be fair, to be transparent, to have accurate and up-to-date information. Those core principles are staying the same under the GDPR. The same can be said of the definition. Some of the key definitions are staying the same, about like what is personal information, what is sensitive personal data. Some of them might get slightly rebranded or reworded about what they're called, but essentially some of the key definitions are not changing. The biggest area of change is about transparency and accountability. Can you really demonstrate that you understand how you are collecting, handling, using, justifying your personal information? To be genuinely transparent, you have to know why you are collecting information, on what lawful basis, how long you're going to retain it for, who needs to have access to it, who do you share it with, and the GDPR is very strong about you having to tell individuals that sort of level of detail. The same can be said for accountability. The need to not just say, well, we will comply. The need to actually show well, how are we delivering that within the organization? Which roles are taking on which elements of accountability to manage day in, day out, the risks and benefits around collecting and using personal information? 
And one of the areas that gets a lot of press at the moment is the increase in the levels of fines that the regulator may be able to issue. So yes, at the moment, the maximum fine for serious breach is half a million pounds. That is going up to 17 million or 4% of turnover. But the information commissioner herself has said that that's not their current and not going to change. That's not their preferred approach. They are not there to wield a big stick all the time. You know, they're not going to suddenly start issuing substantial fines for the most tiny breach. The issue is more about being able to demonstrate transparency, accountability, to manage reputation and instill and continue to instill trust in anyone whose information you handle, whether they're donors, whether they're service users, whether they're your volunteers, or whether they're your staff. That can be seen in one of the key articles of the GDPR, Article 5, where it says that, as now, you are responsible for complying with the principles. Every organisation will say they will comply with the Data Protection Act, comply with the principles. The difficulty now has always been, how do you demonstrate that? Can you prove it? How did you judge that that's an appropriate level of security? Why do you think that collection and use of information is fair? And the GDPR says, well, actually, we really should know that. So not just being responsible for compliance, we are responsible for being able to demonstrate compliance at any point. And that's a significant change. Those five words make all the difference about a level of transparency and accountability that the GDPR expects from all organisations who are handling personal information. So gone are the days soon when you can take the eight principles, you know, scrub off someone else's logo, put your name at the top and say our policy is to comply with the eight principles and tick a box and move on. The days where that is sufficient are changing next May. Okay, so we've got our first poll. Uh, please do uh, have a look at the question that's coming your way. We'd like to get a sense of how engaged is your organization when it comes to GDPR? At what level has it formally been discussed? Is it just the staff and the teams that are clearly going to be affected? I've seen your management also had clear discussions and formal meetings about it. Has it gone up to the trustee level where their awareness has been raised? Or actually, are you still talking to yourself and anyone else who might listen, but actually it hasn't formally been on anyone's radar? It's not actually progressing. So please do let us have your thoughts on that. The results should come through any moment and we'll get an indication of uh, where organizations are when it comes to formally taking this on. I mean, hopefully data protection is on most standard agendas at some level within the organization. It's a key risk. It's critical to what you're doing as an organization. Hopefully it's already been consistently discussed. We'll see what the poll results say. Okay, the should, results should be coming through to you now. And we'll see what, uh, see what figures we get. Okay, so for most organizations, it was, uh, it has been well discussed, which is fantastic. Nearly half have said that actually it's been discussed at both at the front line, at senior management and at the trustee level, which is excellent. And that's as you would hope, given the importance of handling information and the changes that are coming. Because there are many new aspects of data protection management that are coming. One key area just to flag up is mandatory breach reporting. So at the moment, you're not required by the Data Protection Act to tell the information commissioner or the individuals if and when you have a breach. You're encouraged to. It's best practice. The regulator will treat you more, uh, treat you better if it shows that you're engaging with them and not brushing it under the carpet. But you don't have to. Well, next May, you will be re required by law to report breaches if certain criteria are met. 
to the ICO within three days and in certain circumstances to the individuals who've been affected. So this will shine a very strong light onto many, many sectors who historically have not reported breaches in any way, shape or form. What it does mean internally is those that awareness raising, so staff know what a breach looks like. And there's a clear policy on how you handle breaches when they are reported, when they are escalated. That's going to be critical so you can actually cover that and manage it and know who is going to make the decision to escalate it to the regulator and potentially tell a whole bunch of donors, a whole bunch of service users that you may have had a breach. Another area that's quite different under GDPR is data protection by design and by default. So this is saying that the days of dragging in the compliance person a week before a new project is about to go live is got to change. You know, we've got to have the data protection person in the room at the start of any project or process so they can start talking about the data protection issues, the privacy issues that might be critical to the project. So data protection by design is about saying, well, actually, by law, you should have that discussion early in the process when you're thinking about the project change, when you're looking at the project team, when you're looking for the spec of the new CRM, those data protection issues need to be thought of and brought into that discussion early on. And as I mentioned it a bit earlier, one other key area that's changing is the ability of organizations to claim compensation if there is a loss of privacy. So at the moment, it's quite difficult for all individuals to do that. They have to demonstrate really that they've suffered financially as well as a breach uh, or a loss of their privacy. The GDPR removes that financial issue and says, no, you can just claim for loss of privacy. And this is demonstrated if we look at the Dean Street Clinic breach a few years ago. This was where they did it accidentally expose the email addresses of the people on their distribution list. This is because they were distributing their monthly newsletter. They would cut and paste 780 email addresses into the line carbon copy box, to press send and distribute the newsletter. One month they made a mistake and put it in the two box, which meant the recipients could see everyone else's email address and infer their HIV status. It's an HIV clinic serving a small geographical area, Chelsea and Westminster, in the day and age when you can Google an email address and people maybe haven't been so careful with the settings, the privacy settings on their Facebook, their Instagram, their Twitter, their social media in any way, they essentially outed 730 people's HIV status. Now, senior management come out at the time and say, they're you know, really sorry, it was a human error, personally it feels terrible, but actually it wasn't human error. This was an organizational failing. Could they have taken technical measures to reduce the risk of this happening? Yes, they could have used a MailChimp or some other system to mean they're not manually cutting and pasting all the emails every month. Even if they couldn't afford the technical solution, the organizational approach they could have taken was if somebody looks over someone's shoulder and double checks before they press send. Something to try and reduce the risk. Now, the reputational hit for uh, Dean Street was next day. If you Googled the clinic, you got the ambulance chasing lawyers paid for advert as the first uh, search result. So would you trust that charity to provide a safe, secure service to you? Would you donate your time and money and effort? You still might do. But you might have second thoughts or doubts if that's the first thing you see when you search for the organization. And now when the ICO investigated for exposing 731 email addresses, they were fined 180,000 pounds. That's just the email addresses, but it's the context in which it was held. And that's under the current Data Protection Act, before the fines go up, before individuals are very likely to be able to claim compensation for loss of privacy. 
So this is really about understand, taking this seriously within your organization and really making it work in your setting. So that sort of poses the question, is GDPR a, a revolution or a evolution? And it does depend, it really does depend. A good way of looking at that is the poll that we're gonna put up in a moment about actually what does describe your, you know, how, how currently you take data protection, how up to date is your data protection policy? When was it last updated? Is it something that is always looked at and every year there's a review and it's kept fresh, staff are kept aware of it? Do not have a policy really that you could really point to and say this is our approach to managing data protection? Is it when you last got some pro bono legal support a few years ago? Or actually is it really quite old? And we've seen some of these with the people we work with that they still mention floppy disks and fax and actually they've not been looked at for a long, long time. And essentially they're not really delivering. And you know, policy is, is, is one of those things that yes, it can sit on a shelf and it doesn't achieve, but it gives you a sense that the organization understands it needs to establish how it's going to manage this risk. It needs to understand which roles are taking which accountability, and then who needs to know what at the front line. And the policy often reflects that. Is it well understood, well structured, accessible, and the right people know about it? Or is it just sat there and it's not really doing a job? So we'll see uh, the results uh, anytime soon and see uh, what sort of uh, policies and approaches uh, you feel you have out there. Certainly with the people we work with, we see a mixture. We see some that are very up to date, they are kept fresh, they are adapted. When new guidance comes along when internal changes are made and some that are all pretty tired and haven't been looked at so two-thirds of you are saying that it's updated within the last year which is fantastic it shows that you're actually taking it seriously and taking it on board and therefore gdpr is more likely to be an evolution as it should be a continuation of the management of information. So GDPR is both. It depends where you are in handling personal information. And if you're already up to speed with the current law, if you already take it seriously at the right levels, then it will be an evolution. There'll be tweaks and changes that you will need to undertake to prepare and be ready for the new levels and expectations that the GDPR brings. So if you already consider personal data to be a broad definition, but it does cover an awful lot of information that you're handling. If you already recognize that processing of data covers not just the active things that you do with it, not just the collection and the storage and the updating, if you recognize that it does cover data when it's sat on a shelf, when it's on a backup tape, then you'll be fine. And if you already see consent as a clear positive indication that someone has agreed to what you want to do with their information, rather than it being an opt out or an implied consent or something other than just clearly someone agreeing unambiguously, they clearly have indicated that they are happy for you to do things with their information, then GDPR will not be a revolution. It'll be a continuation of what you're already doing. But it does very much depend. An understanding about consent is a good example of where you might be on this. If you understand that consent is one of the six ways of justifying what you're doing with information, and if you have clarity on precisely what you do collect and use information for, what purposes you use information for, then GDPR will not be you know, the scary thing that often people try and portray it to be. If you have clarity and understand that consent is one of the six ways of justifying things, and actually it's the most difficult one. The ICO, the quote from the ICO about consent should be the last thing you look for. If you can justify your use of data on one of the other five, it's far more straightforward to do that and far more beneficial to do that. 
So is it because you have a legal obligation to comply with? You have to collect and use the information. The law mandates it. Is it because you're fulfilling a public function? So large chunks of the public sector, but others may perform public tasks that need information to be collected and used and shared and stored. Might it be because of a contract that you have with the individual? You've established that to provide a service to work for you, you need to collect a new certain information and you've told them that in the contract and they have signed up. Is it a life or death situation? Well, the common sense kicks in that you have to use information to help some, protect someone's life. Or is it the sixth one in the middle, legitimate interests, where you are balancing your needs and you're clear what your needs are as an organization. You've considered the individuals on whether what you want to do with the information will cause harm to their rights and interests. You've assessed that and you've concluded it's in your favor. You need to use the information for your interests. So understanding the lawful basis is critical. It's critical because when it comes to the individual's rights, you're going to need to know that to be able to manage the questions and queries and the handling of information, the enhanced rights that all individuals will have under the GDPR. Some of these rights are very similar to what we've got now. Some are enhanced, we said about compensation being enhanced, the breach notification being enhanced, being told, having to tell individuals that you've lost or breached their privacy or lost their information. But this is again, as I said, not just waiting for a date next year, this is about how it works day in, day out. So when these sort of questions and queries happen, when someone says, can I delete my data, it's going to depend on why you are collecting and using the information, what purposes are you fulfilling, what justifies your collection and use of that information. Because how you respond to people requesting things and trying to do things with their information will depend. So if someone wants to withdraw their consent, as they say, delete all the, the data that you hold on them, if they object to you relying on your interest to collect and use their information, if they say, I object to direct marketing, stop sending it to me. If they say, well, I want my information. I want you to give me a copy of it within a month. These are all legitimate questions and queries that might come in now or certainly next May. And the understanding you're going to need to have internally of the information, the personal information you're handling and using is going to be critical for how efficiently and effectively you can deal with these or how much of an administrative burden it's going to be. So if someone says, I withdraw my consent, well, what does consent apply to? What are you relying on? Why activities rely on consent and what don't? When they say delete my data, well, it won't, it's not absolute. Some data you will need to retain for some legal reasons. Other data, yes, you would get rid of on request. What are you relying legitimate interest to undertake? Which activities does that apply to? What direct marketing do you do? And what isn't direct marketing? What is administrative? What is service delivery? Being clear on that is going to be important. And the same with subject access. Where is the information? On what systems? What issues might there be about third party privacy and exemptions? Again, the processes and understanding where information is and manage that is going to be important. Okay, so for the last uh, last five minutes of the presentation, we're just going to look at the roles and responsibilities when it comes to GDPR, and specifically this term data protection officer. So many people have fulfilled that role over the years. I personally have been a data protection officer in my past working life. The difference with GDPR is that at the moment that term has no legal basis. Under GDPR it will it will mean a certain thing as defined by the general data protection regulation. And certain sectors and certain organizations will have to appoint a legally defined data protection officer. So public authorities will have to appoint data protection officers. Those organizations where their core activity is the large scale systematic monitoring of individuals 
So the Googles and Facebooks of this world will have to appoint formal data protection officers. And organizations where their core activity is a large scale handling of sensitive information and criminal conviction data will also have to appoint a data protection officer. Now there's still some debate and a lack of guidance around what large scale means in practice. That is problematic. It's not clear quite whether charities, certain charities will fall into the third category there. But now it's about analyzing where we are with the guidance we've got and documenting your internal decision at the moment about whether you feel you have to appoint a DPO, whether you are choosing to appoint a DPO and being conscious if you do, the full requirements of the GDPR will apply. And if you're not required to and you're not formally appointing one, then call them something else to make that distinction to ensure there's no confusion over the role where you are allocating responsibility to lead on this and make compliance happen. Because if you appoint a DPO, there are particular issues for the employer. You are committing that that individual will have the resources required to meet their obligations, that they can act independently, that they will report to the highest level of management within the organization. So it's quite an undertaking to appoint a data protection officer. And there's also potential for conflict of interest. The law is clear that it can be an existing employee if there's no conflict of interest. So it cannot be the head of IT, the head of HR, because they will be at some point marking their own homework. So for now, it is about saying, well, okay, who needs to be in the room when we're looking at GDPR? All these areas will be involved in compliance and handling data in some way. Who is gonna lead in pulling this together? And our final poll question is looking at that, which best describes your current approach? What resources have you allocated to managing this, both now and beyond May next year? Is it currently you and you know it's something you're doing on top of your day job? Someone's had some training and hopefully that training would enable them to take it forward and manage it. Are you bringing in some temporary resource or you're planning to bring a consultant in for a period of time? Or actually have you got a project team who's pulling in from the right areas within your organization and there are clear roles and responsibilities throughout the organization to not just deal with it between now and May, but to embed it and make it work beyond the next May. You know, and there are various ways of doing this. There is no right answer to particularly how you're going to manage this on an ongoing basis, but it does need to have someone senior pulling it together. It does need to have some results to make it happen. And like I said at the start, I think there's a, a risk that we see it as a one-off thing, a bit like Y2K, we're waiting for this date. And actually, there's a, there is a project to do, but it's actually how we're going to make it work beyond that. How are we going to embed this within the organization? So I'll just give it a second for, for as many of you as possible to uh, participate in the poll. And we'll see what the, uh, what the results are. This will be interesting to see. So as, as I kind of might have thought, it's half the people out there have said it's, it's you and it's an addition to your day job in some way, shape or form. You know, that's understandable. It's about resource and how much effort and resource we've got out there. The issue is have you got the real time to commit to this and the expertise to make it work in reality? And that's where the judgment is within the organization. So to finish off, we're just going to quickly look at what we think some key actions you can look at now to try and take this forward. And the first one, if it's not already raised, uh, raised is the awareness and leadership within the organization. Getting senior management on board, getting the trustees to engage, to recognize that there are reputational risks if this is not managed properly. There are resource implications if suddenly 20, 40, 50% of your service users or donors said, I want to see my information. How are we going to manage that? Who's accountable, whether it's a DPO or a data protection lead? I'm not just saying someone's going to do it, are the resources there and the support there to help them and make it a reality? 
And as you said, it's recognised it's not a tick the box exercise. That it's just saying we've got a policy on a shelf, we're job done. This is about how you as an organisation value and manage this very key asset, which is personal information. We also need to get to know ourselves, understand who are the key organization teams or individuals within the organization, what activities do they undertake, what services are they delivering, who are the data subjects, what categories of individuals are you working with, where does information enter your organization, when does it exit and go to other either partners, suppliers, what are those flows and where are the key risks. And then looking at the purposes, if you can document the purposes that you use information for, get some clarity on the lawful basis that justifies your collection use of that information and, and relate it to your organization, the teams and the activities you undertake. If possible, you know, get on and address the quick wins. Roll out key processes and standards and procedures if you've not already got them there. Some you should have, like subject access. Others that are newer, like breach reporting, you're going to have to think about raising awareness, the internal processes that you are going to follow to make sure that there is clarity on who will make the final decision and who will escalate it to the information commissioner and the individuals affected if needs be. What are the key security risks? You know, for us, it seems to be you know, sharing of information via email. The speed with which you can do it is great, but actually looking at the sensitivity and the volume and making sure there are appropriate ways of sharing the most sensitive information. And the same with remote working. Bring your own device, working outside the office, great flexibility. The GDPR is just saying, have you really thought about is the level of security sufficient and which roles are doing what jobs outside the office? What data are they handling when they're on the move? And looking at the privacy notices and policy, the points where data comes into your organization. What are people told when they are handing over their personal information? That transparency is critical again. And then finally, it's about having a plan to embed those changes and manage it beyond next May. You know, I think the Information Commissioner herself is pretty aware that lots of people are going to struggle to be fully compliant by next May. What they will look for is for those organisations who understand the key issues, who've got a plan, who are working through it, who know where the key risks are and are doing the practical things to reduce those risks, and have a clear plan in place. The Information Commissioner has prepared a 12-step uh, guide and the NCBO has done a, a very accessible version of that which is on their website. That is a good place to start as well. The Information Commissioner has, I think, just uh, over the last few days said they're going to update that document to give greater clarity on the key things you should look at. Okay, so I hope that's been a useful uh, quick overview of some of the key issues that we see when it comes to preparing for the GDPR. Thank you for participating in the polls. Uh, we have a number of uh, questions, as you might imagine, given the short time we've had to talk about this topic. So uh, I'm going to get my colleague John to read out some of the uh, some of the questions. We obviously could do as many as we can within the 10-15 minutes that we've got. Uh, so, good, John, I'll just uh, yes. have a look at some of these uh, questions here. Yes, um, so we've got one from Petra, um, looking at what level of detail are we asking for with consent? Um, it's literally just looking at whether we can contact individuals via email, phone, uh, post, um, or should they be asking uh, for permission to contact them about fundraising, uh, research, support and events. Um, and do we need to clarify them further if if someone's interested in fundraising, um, to ask if they're interested in sort of community events, uh, challenge events and sort of oversee tracks as well. So okay, and this is thank you, John. This is a, a very uh, common question at the moment about basically the level of granularity you do or don't need when you are collecting consent from individuals. So the GDPR 
is clear that you need separate consents for separate processing operations. The question is, how separate is separate? How different is different? Now, the fundraising regulators guidance says, well, think about how you operate as an organization. Yes, it's fine to break it. We've got to break it down by channel. That's that's a given. But do you want to bundle all the things that you do into one sort of generic overarching purpose when actually some of those things are quite different? Is research different to raising income, to playing the lottery, to campaigning to change the law, to running events? I think there's a strong argument to say those activities are, are different and people may or may not want to participate in one or some or all of them. This is about saying, well, do you want to give them that choice? And if you don't, are you confident enough why you're not giving them that choice? So as always, with data protection, there's no sort of right or wrong answer. It's about you thinking about, as an organization, what's our approach? We do need to recognize that if you do bundle it all together, it's, it, you're giving people all or nothing. So if they then withdrew their consent, they're withdrawing their consent for all of that activity rather than saying, well, actually, I don't want to now hear about one element of it, but I do still want to hear about another. So, yes, there is uh, definitely the, the separation for the channels, but granularity of purpose is a, a question for yourselves as an organization. Um, so looking at online forms, Gary, to gain consent, um, do we need sort of electronic signature or is kind of tick boxes sufficient uh, without a signature? So, yes, yeah, so this is about Actually, we do, under GDPR, need records of consent. We need to show that they've made an unambiguous indication. So the question about whether you know, an electronic signature, actually someone signing to commit that they have agreed, or whether they tick a box or press a button or take an action is sufficient. The issue there is about the sensitivity of the information. So the ICO's guidance at the moment says if it's sensitive personal data, then you're going to need clear, explicit agreement. You know, if you're collecting using their medical data, you're going to need them to definitely agree and put it in writing. If we're looking at fundraising or other uh, activities where it's not as sensitive, then you just need an unambiguous indication by clear action. So that could be a tick box, it could be pressing a button, and it could be returning an email. The ICO says there's lots of uh, potential ways of getting GDPR standard consent when it comes to non-sensitive personal information. Fantastic. Um, so the next one's from Sue saying, do we need to get our clients and volunteers to opt in to receive invitations about our events? Um, the events are such as activities, lunch clubs, coffee mornings, and cinema events. Okay, so this is really looking at what information do volunteers need to receive to be a volunteer for your organization, and which information might you send to clients or anyone else about what you do as an organization. And to me, they're two different things. You might still want to say, send the same invites to coffee mornings and cinema events, whether they're a client or a volunteer, and the client or volunteer should have a choice about whether they receive that information. But quite rightly, volunteers, to fulfill that role within your organization, as part of uh, your organization, will need to receive some information, whether it's about the latest health and safety update, whether it's about the work you're doing and what they can participate in. So it's understanding internally, well, what messages need to be given to volunteers and where might a volunteer have choice about receiving other material. And that might be that you say, well, it is separate. They are, we are treating that volunteer like anybody else who's got an interest in what we're doing. And we're telling them about our events and how they might raise income for us. So understanding what you want to use the information for, what messages you're trying to get across is critical. Okay, so we have another one here. Uh, let's have a look, John. 
Yeah. There's one from Shona um, reporting about the DPO. Uh, should they report directly to trustees um, or the senior management team? She's read conflicting advice. Okay, so the DPO role, it's clear in the GPR that you have to report to the senior management within the organisation. Now, I think for charities, that is trustee level. They are the ultimate arbiters, they are the ultimate accountable body. They need to know. They need to be told what is happening with regards to handling of personal information in the organization. And if there is an issue that the DPO finds, it has to be reported to that most senior of levels. Um, practically, how that happens, you know, how often it's reported and escalated, I can see that it might need to go to the management team first to be able to re be reported on a structured basis to the trustees. But I think ultimately, it needs to get through to the trustees. They need to understand, they need to be told, because ultimately they're the ones that can make decisions on allocating budget and resource and looking at how ultimately information is handled within the organization. Okay, I think we've got time for one or two more questions. Okay, let's have a look, John, what we've got there. There's one from Atkin saying, can you go over the processing keys? Okay, so the term processing is often uh, sort of misunderstood because it sounds like an active thing, the doing of something with information, processing it, doing, undertaking activities. And yes, it does cover all activities that you might do with information. So from the moment it's collected until the moment it's securely destroyed, that is processing the data. What's often overlooked is it does include data that is, you know, when it's just sat there, when it's sat in the system, when it's on a backup tape, when it's stuck in a paper archive off site, you are still processing that data when it comes to both the current law and, and the GDPR. What it does mean is that it's, you know, it's not enough just to say, well, we're going to archive that record, whether it's in the database or in a paper form you are still responsible for securely handling that information. Now it's true that archiving it may restrict the amount of access and that is useful, but it's not the same as saying, well, we've stopped handling that data and we don't have to try and comply with the requirements of the Data Protection Act or the GDPR. Okay, uh, let's have a look at another question. We've got one more left, I think. Okay, yes, that's a good one there. Yeah, Andy would like to know what would be considered compliant evidence for consent for verbal, uh, verbally, um, so received over the phone. Okay, so the GDPR is clear that you can obtain consent verbally. The guidance from the Information Commissioner so far, which hasn't been finalised yet, is clear it's about being able to demonstrate back to someone if they questioned well why are you sending me this or you say i've agreed well, what did i agree to being able to evidence it and demonstrate it is the key thing so if it is verbal is there a set statement that is read that you know was in force at the time so you can have on file you know set statement a was read and the person agreed and you know what that text said so that ability to understand, yes, this is what the person agreed to verbally, whether it was part of the script, it was what was read out, it was what was understood, having that clarity on record is what's critical. I think you can see for the more sensitive information, you know, if you were going to get verbal consent to undertake medical research, where actually, yes, in the future you may be taken to court, so there may be some real serious implications for that confirmation that someone gave verbally, you might need a recording because you might need to fall back on that. So I think it does come down to the sensitivity of the information. Now we'll wait to see whether the information commissioner says, well, no, if it's verbal, it has to be, you know, the higher standard it has to be absolute proof. To me, it's about risk and it's about being able to demonstrate back to someone so you can have that discussion why you think they've agreed. So yeah, verbal consent is definitely a way of getting consent under GDPR. I think it's about the sensitivity of the information you're getting consent for. Okay, thank you very much. We've got lots and lots of questions. I, I'm sorry we can only get a few round to a few of them. I hope that session has been useful.
the uh, yeah the there will be a short survey feedback coming your way. Uh, there will be a copy of the slides and the recording will be available online after the event. I hope that should be tomorrow, all things uh, going well. So I hope that's been a useful session and thank you very much.